How to make the table runner, part of Amber Makes Sewing School. Learn how to quilt and make this table runner to fit your table perfectly, the quick and easy way. Follow me and I'll show you how. It's available in a choice of two different prints. Cutting out. Start by pressing the printed fabric panel that's in your kit. You can see that there are two pieces. There's the table runner upper panel and the table runner lower panel and also the binding strip which is beneath them, which you use to bind the edge of your runner. Cut out all the pieces around the outer edges because all the seam allowances are included and pin the label to the top of each piece. You can see here that I've cut the two pieces out because then I can join them together to make one long table runner or two short table runners. I've also cut out the binding fabric. This will be cut into strips later on to bind the runner, so just put this to one side for now. You will also need some backing fabric. This extra piece of fabric that's on the runner, on the panel, you can use for your own makes. Here's some backing fabric and some wadding. I've used insulating wadding and the details of all the measurements are listed in the instructions for you to use. Preparing the panels. Once you've measured your table and decide whether you want to make one short runner or a longer one. If you want to make a longer one, you need to join them together. So if you're making the festive patchwork panel, on the right hand side of the upper panel, trim it, the sashing piece, so that it measures one and a quarter of an inches in width. You can see here I'm lining up my ruler on the edge of the sashing strip so that now I'm trimming a little piece off so it measures one and a quarter inch width. This allows me to attach it to the other panel so that it has a seamless join. Now take the lower panel and on the left hand short side you also need to trim this sashing strip so it measures one and a quarter inch width. I'm just going to turn it around because it's easier to cut it and measure it like this. Now I'm using a rotary cutter and ruler for this. If you don't have a rotary cutter, just measure it, mark a line with a pencil and draw along it. So it measures one and a quarter inch width. Once you've trimmed that piece off, you can now take the upper panel and the lower panel and place them right sides facing on the sashing strip that you've just trimmed. Not on this, the outer satin strips, but the ones that you've trimmed. So place them down so they are right sides facing and then pin them together. For a really neat join, just make sure that the fabric where the print changes, where the corner squares are, the dark print to the green pin, just push a pin through and make sure that those lines match up exactly. The panels are exactly the same width, so they will match up, but this just helps you to get a neater finish. And then once your runner is quilted and finished, you won't be able to see this central join because we're joining them together so that this sashing will be the same width as all the other sashing strips, which are between the printed patchwork designs. So again, match up that section and pin it together. And then you can pin it at the end and then pin it between. Make sure the raw edges match up. Now sew the two panels together all the way along this pinned edge. Once that's done, press this seam open. Now if you turn it over, you can see now that this, where you've joined that, that sashing strip is now the same width as all the other sashing strips. Now if you need to trim this long panel to make it the right length for your table. In the instructions it explains how to measure your table and what drop you need to add. Then trim it from the ends. I think it helps to get a neater finish if this central join is in the centre. So you may need to trim off some sections on the end to get it to be exactly the right length. If you're making the winter foliage then you don't need to trim anything. Just place the right hand short end of the upper panel right sides facing with the left hand short end of the lower panel. The panels have been designed on this one so that when you join them together and sew them together the prints will match up exactly because we've designed them so that there is an extra quarter of an inch so that when they're joined together they match up exactly. So just place them right sides facing matching the raw edges. 
Now, I found I didn't really need to match up the prints when I did this because of all the foliage and all the different parts. You will find that if you just pin them together at either end and then pin them in the centre, making sure the raw edges match, it will all match up exactly. And because you've got all the foliage and the berries, then the join is much more hidden. So once you've pinned it together along this short end, then sew together. And then you can see here, I've pressed the seam open. And now when you turn it over, you've got a perfect joint. And again, trim off the ends of the panels if you need to adjust the length to make it fit your table. The maximum length it can be is 100 inches in long length, but you may need it shorter. If you're making, obviously, two table runners, you, only, you won't need to do this joining. But that's how to get the really neat join. And then measure this panel because you'll need this measurement to calculate how much backing and wadding you need. Preparing the backing and wadding. The measurements in the instructions detail how to cut the backing and you may need to join it if your backing isn't wide enough or you can use extra wide backing. But it explains how to measure your runner top that you've just placed together and how much bigger to make it. The backing fabric is cut four inches bigger all round than the runner top just so that you have lots of extra to play with and it makes it much easier to quilt with this extra allowance. So cut your backing fabric and join it if necessary following the instructions. Next, you need to cut your wadding. The wadding is cut three inches bigger all round than the runner top. This just means it's much easier to layer the wadding on top of the backing fabric and then the runner top on top and then you can see the edges of everything. Now, if you're using extra wide wadding, then you won't need to join it. But if you are using smaller pieces or if you're using something like this insulating wadding, which isn't wide enough, then you may need to join it. And there are two different ways to doing this. The easiest way is to use a special tape. It's called a basting tape and it's used to join the wadding together. So place the two pieces of wadding so the edges butt up against each other. Then cut your tape a little bit longer and place it with the glue side down on top. So this basting or batting tape, it can be called either, needs to be placed centrally over that join. Make sure that the wadding doesn't overlap at all, but is just butting up. Then place just a piece of cotton fabric, just because if you press on top of the batting tape, it can sometimes stick to the iron. The batting tape will explain exactly how long you need to press for. I found about five seconds in each place was enough just to hold it firmly together, but do make sure that you put a pressing cloth on top or it may melt the tape. Remove that once it's done and just check everything is stuck. You can then trim off the top and the bottom ends and then you'll find you've got a nice neat join. Once this is all quilted, you won't see this join but because it's butting up and not overlapping, then you won't see it and all the quilting will hold it together. Another option if you don't have batting tape is to sew it together by hand. So again, Butt up the two edges of the wadding and sew them together using a herringbone stitch. Now I'm using a red thread here just so that you can see the stitches. But when you do yours, use a cream or white thread to match your wadding because you don't want these stitches to show through the runner top. But I'm just using a red thread so you can see it. So secure the thread on the right hand piece and then take it over with the needle going from the bottom to the top on the left hand piece. Take the needle over to the right hand piece and... Thread your needle so it goes upwards, so from the bottom to the top, over to the left hand, underneath, bottom to top, back over to the right hand piece, bottom to top. I've placed my stitches about a half, quarter to half an inch away from where the join is and I've spaced them about half an inch apart. Obviously, the closer that you make them, the more secure this join will be. But as the wadding is going to be placed between the backing and the runner top and you'll be quilting through it, that will hold it together. This herringbone stitch is just to hold the pieces together to stop them shifting. And by making these diagonal stitches, it just makes a nice join that isn't too tight. And it's a flat join because you need these, these batting pieces to be flat. And so that's how you do it by hand. Layering the fabrics. You now need to layer the, bat the three fabrics together. So start by taking your backing fabric, place it right sides down on a flat surface and tape it around the edge. 
You need to tape it so it lays flat, but so you're not distorting the fabric. I'm making sure there are no creases. Now place your wadding or batting on top so it's just within the edges. So you can see, because I've cut the way I've cut it, that the edges of the wadding come one inch inside the, bat, the backing fabric. It makes it a lot easier if you cut these a slightly different size. Now once you've done that, you now need to baste the wadding to the backing fabric. Now you can do this by with pins but I'm going to do this by spray basting. So to do this start in the centre, pull the wadding back and spray the wadding. Not the backing fabric but the wadding. So just spray about 20 inches of it. Then fold it over where the glue is onto the backing fabric and just pat it down making sure that there are no wrinkles and it's nice and flat. Because you've taped your backing fabric in place that won't move. Then continue doing that all the way along. When you get to the end, spray the end section and then push it down in the centre and then push out the corners. This does help to get a neater, flatter finish at the corners. With a table runner like this that's quite narrow, it doesn't matter so much, but if you're using this method for a quilt, when you get to the end, do the centre and then the corners. And repeat that so that the wadding is attached to the backing fabric all over. Now take your runner top and place that centrally on top of the wadding. Again, the runner top will be smaller than the wadding in the backing fabric, so place it centrally on top. Now in the same way, Peel back the runner top about halfway, spray the wadding and then carefully and gently push the runner top on top and smooth it out with your hands. The basting spray is repositionable so if you find there's any bumps or creases that you don't like, pull it back and start again. Then working from the centre to the other side exactly the same. Spray the wadding. The instructions on your can will explain exactly how far away from the wadding to spray and how much to spray on and then smooth it all so there are no creases and again peel back the runner top if you find there are any creases. Once you've done that it's now all joined really neatly together. Obviously you can pin these three layers together either using pins or special curved safety pins but this is the quickest and easiest way to do it either by but you can spray based or pin depending on which method you prefer working the quilting you now need to decide what quilting pattern you want to work on your table runner with this one i decided to quilt all along the printed lines which means i didn't need to mark my panel at all because i just followed the lines and worked around the sashing and all the stars and the poinsettias you can work as much or as little quilting as you like with the winter foliage one i decided to quilt some horizontal lines through it so i marked these in place first using a heat erasable pen i then quilted along them and then i just pressed them afterwards and that removed the lines but it's entirely up to you what pattern you choose When you decide to work the quilting, set your stitch length to about 3 to 3.5. And if you've got a walking foot, do use that as it helps to get it all the way through. And then with this one, because I stitched along the printed lines, simply follow the lines. Because this table runner is narrow, even if it's long, it's really easy to get under your machine. And if you've never quilted before, this is a great opportunity to learn. You can start off by just quilting a few sections. And if you're happy with it, then quilt even more. With this one, I quilted all along the sashing pieces first and then I quilted around the stars and the poinsettias and I added more quilting as I went along until I was happy with the finished result. And this is what it looks like when it's finished. You can see I've quilted around all the stars and the poinsettias so this actually looks like I've patchworked this myself rather than it just being a printed panel. I've used a thread that matches the top of the runner because I was quite happy that the, the white thread was on the red backing. Now you now need to trim your runner top so because you've got to trim the wadding in the backing so it is level with the runner top. The easiest thing to do is to use a rotary cutter. So line up the line on your rotary on your ruler with the sashing. I lined it up so that I could keep the sashing nice and straight because sometimes with the quilting it can pull it up a little bit but when you bind the edges it will cover anything so if you find that the edge is a little bit narrower so I've lined up the two inch mark on my ruler with the edge of this sashing then any extra wadding and backing will be covered by the binding. So now you can see it's all trimmed and if you're making the other style of runner just do exactly the same trim the runner top 
So the wadding and the backing so that it's level with the runner top and you're ready now for the next stage. Making the binding. You now need to calculate the length of your binding, following the instructions to work it out. Once you've worked out the length of your binding, you need to cut the piece of binding fabric that's on your panel into two inch strips. There's enough fabric on this panel to bind two short runners using the upper and the lower panel separately or when joined together to bind the whole of one long runner. So you can make one long one or two short ones. So once you've calculated it, cut as many two inch strips as you need from the piece of binding. So I've cut all of my pieces now into two inch strips. I now need to join them together to make one long piece so that I can bind it all in one go. So take one of the binding strips and place it horizontally right sides up. Take another binding strip and place it vertically right sides down on top. Just place it down on top just so you can mark on the top binding strip where the bottom one meets it. So you can see I've just pasted a little dot now draw a diagonal line from the top left hand corner to that dot. This is going to be your sewing line. Now place the two strips right sides facing again but making sure the top and the side raw edges are matching so that little dot in the bottom right hand corner meets up with the bottom corner of the bottom strip. Pin together either side of the line if you pin just outside the line, it means you can keep these pins in place while you sew, which just makes it easier. And then sew them together using a matching thread along that line. Once you've done that, place them on your ironing board, press to set the seam, then open out the two strips. Open up the seam allowance and press it flat. And then trim it, the seam allowance, to a quarter of an inch outside the seam. These diagonal seams mean that you will have less bulk in the binding so it will lie flatter and also the seam is less visible because this diagonal seam will be less visible than a horizontal seam. Once you've finished pressing like that, press from the right hand side to make sure it's nice and flat. Now do repeat this process to join all your cut binding strips together in exactly the same way with these diagonal joins until you've joined all the strips together and then you've made one long binding strip so that you are ready now to bind your table runner. Attaching the binding strip. We're using a single fold binding on this table runner and I want to machine stitch it from the right side. So lay your table runner wrong sides up and find the centre of one long edge. Place your binding strip right sides down on top so one of the short ends meets, meets roughly the centre of this edge and pin it into place. So the right side of the binding is facing the wrong side of the runner. Measure four inches down from the top of the binding and just make a mark. And this is where you're going to start stitching. It means you'll have four inches unstitched of binding. This will help with joining the two ends together later. Then pin the binding all the way down. Make sure as you're pinning it that the raw edges are matching and that the binding is always right sides facing with the wrong side of the runner. I prefer to do my binding like this because if I'm going to hand stitch the other side into place, I do it from the right side, but because I want to machine stitch so it's nice and sturdy, particularly because it'll be going through the washing machine a lot, then I prefer to do all the machine stitching. So if you start by stitching it on the wrong side of the runner, then the whole of the binding will be machine stitched into place. Now pin it all the way down to the corner and we're going to create a mitered corner. So just mark where the, bot the binding meets the bottom of the runner. Measure half an inch up from here, like I'm doing here, and then measure half an inch inwards along this line so that there's a little dot half an inch in from the side and half an inch up from the bottom because we're going to use a half an inch seam allowance for sewing this on. Now start stitching from that mark that's four inches from the top and stitch using your half an inch seam allowance all the way down to that little point that you've marked and then stitch diagonally into the corner. You can draw this line on before you stitch if you prefer. And this is what will create the mitered corner. Once you've done it, it will look like this. So just give it a little press just to set the seam and remove your markings. Now turn it round so that that corner is in the top right hand corner. Fold the binding strip upwards. 
making sure that the edge of the raw edge of the binding strip runs in a straight line level with the next edge of the runner and then give it a press. That pressed line really helps to get your mitered corner later and just pin it into place but away from any of the seams just to hold it into place. Now fold the binding strip back down again so it's right sides facing with the wrong side of the runner and so that that fold lies right on the top raw edge and then pin it into place. You can see there's one of the joins of the binding strip here in the corner. That will always happen, it doesn't matter. It will just get lost in the mitered corner. So make sure that that fold is level with the top raw edge and then the raw edges of the binding strip are level with the raw edges of the runner. I find it's easier to press the binding into place and then pin it. It helps to keep it nice and flat. And I find then that when I'm sewing it into place, the binding is exactly in the right place by just pressing it before I pin. Then pin it all the way down to the bottom and then mitre this corner in exactly the same way as you did the other one. So you're going to measure half an inch up from the bottom and half an inch in from the side. So you can see I've measured half inch from the side, half inch from the bottom. You'll have to fold the binding back a little bit just to find where that bottom is. Mark that dot and then draw that diagonal line. Then starting from the top, sew all the way down. Stop at the dot and sew into the corner. And then continue mitering all four corners all in exactly the same way. Joining the ends of the binding. There are several ways to join the ends of the binding, but the way I'm going to do it is makes it a really neat, almost invisible join. So once you've mitered all the corners, then stop stitching four inches up from the center, which means there'll be an eight inch gap between the start and finish of the seams, which gives you enough space to join your binding. Now place the end strip on top of the starting strip. Make sure they're both lying nice and flat and place the top, the ending strip on top of the starting strip and just mark on there exactly where it joins the starting end. Now measure two inches down from this, that's the width of the binding. So it needs to overlap the, the starting end by the same width of the binding, which is two inches. You're going to cut along this line. I like to draw a straight line to make sure it's nice and straight. So just draw that straight line, double check that it's overlapped and you haven't cut it the same length. It needs to cut overlap by two inches and cut along that line. So remember, you overlap by the same width as the binding. Now we need to join these together and they're actually joined together in exactly the same way as you did when you joined the binding strips at the, together at the beginning. So place the two ends of the strip at right angles, right sides facing like this. Now you need to mark where the top strip meets the bottom strip in that bottom corner. Just mark that with a pen. So it's two inches down from the top right hand corner if you're doing it using this binding, obviously. Now draw the diagonal line from the top left hand corner down to the bottom right. So you can measure two inches down or you can overlap them. I'm just showing you this if you want to use this for other binding later on. Place them back right sides facing and then pin together either side of the line and you're going to sew. So the joining of the binding is done in exactly the same way as when you're joining all of the binding strips. It's just this measurement of getting them overlapping that you need to watch. Now sew together down that diagonal line and then it will look like this. And just as you did when you joined the binding strips, press that seam open and flat. So just open out the seam allowances and press it flat. But by having this eight inches that's unjoined, it gives you enough space to manoeuvre to be able to do this. Trim the seam allowance so it's quarter of an inch outside the edge of the stitching, just like you did before. And then press it flat again, just because when you've trimmed it, it pushes the seam back together. So press it flat again. And now you have joined the ends of the binding together and they will fit exactly along the edge of your runner. So you've got a nice, neat diagonal join which is much less obtrusive than having a straight join or by overlapping because you don't have the bulk. And also, because all the binding strips are joined together diagonally, it's impossible then to see where the binding strips are joined and where you've joined the ends of them. But by overlapping by the same width as the binding, that's the key to getting it to fit exactly. Now stitch the binding back into place, starting on top of one seam and finishing on top of the other. Once that's done, your binding is now all sewn into place, 
all the way along around your runner with neat mitered corners. And you've, if I fold it over, you can see you've got that nice, neat diagonal join. Finishing the binding. Now you've sewn the binding into place, we need no, now need to finish it off. So fold the binding upwards away from the wrong side, the backing fabric side of the runner, all the way around. This just helps to have a nice neat seam before you fold it over to the right side. So start with the backing fabric uppermost and fold the binding and press it upwards. And then you'll have that seam laying right on the edge. When you reach the corners, remove any of the pins that are still in place and press into the corners. Because you've used the mitered corner method for sewing, those corners will automatically be diagonal. So just press it upwards, take your time to make sure that this seam is laying right on the edge. It will just give you a neater finish. And you can see here, I've pressed the binding away from the back of the runner all the way around. Now turn it over to the right side. Now fold the long raw edge under, and then over to the front so that it just covers that line of stitching where you attach the binding. You probably need to turn that long edge under, it should be half an inch as that's the seam allowance, just but because of the bulk of the runner, I find if you turn it under a little bit less, about, called, about three eighths of an inch, and then fold it over, then it will cover that line of stitching correctly. So just make sure you may have to adjust how much you turn the long end under. There's plenty of fabric, but make sure it covers that line of machine stitching. Now, pin up to one corner. And then before you arrange the corner in its mitre, pin and press over and pin the other side. I find it easier to pin up to the corners before I deal with the corners because then everything's folded over in the right place. Take your time to do this by folding, pressing and pinning because it's important that you cover that line of machine stitching for a really neat finish, but only just covering it. Now, when you get to the corner, you'll need to just fold those long edges under just a little bit and then fold it upwards like this and then back down to create a diagonal corner. You'll need to fiddle with this a little bit to adjust it so you get a nice diagonal corner so you get right in there. If you look over on the right side, you've got that lovely diagonal corner on the backing fabric side. That's already there, but you just need to create that diagonal corner. And then repeat that all the way around by pressing and pinning. So you can see here, I've pinned it all the way around the edge. I've got nice, neat diagonal corners on both sides. And it's ready to be stitched into place. But do take the time with this stage because this is the finishing off of your runner. This is what will make it look really professional. Now, top stitch into place working from the right side. I've stitched it about a sixteenth of an inch, so only just in from the edge. And I used a thread that matched the binding fabric. You can use a contrast thread if you prefer. So now this table runner is finished. It's neatly bound all the way around the edge. It's got nice, neat diagonal corners. Because of all the quilting, it looks like I've patchworked this all myself. So it's a really quick and easy way of making a festive table runner. If you've made the winter foliage design, you can see I quilted those lines horizontally all the way through and then I've bound the edges and I've used a dark green fabric on the back so now my table is all ready to be decorated using one one of my runners and remember there's enough fabric in your kit to either make two short runners or one long runner so that you can decorate your table perfectly for Christmas. <laughs>